See, I always viewed football uh, as an entertainment industry, and I think that's what made me different from, from a lot of other people. I wanted to be an entertainer. It's just bizarre, the world that we live in, where people just try to stick labels on you. I, I, got, I got called an anti vaxxer This is the best one. I got called an anti-vaxxer. And I'm you the Michael Anthony show. Once politics got involved... Uh, in the Premier League, my interest level declined. I should have left my wife without somebody else being involved. That's the one thing I regret in my life. The sinking sand of despair The smell of dread in the air I'm head to toe in my own fear I'm going to die and I need to cry ah. So welcome to episode 140 of the Michael Anthony Show As we are joined by a biblical figure for today's episode um, We've had some footballers on the show before Captain Marvel, Brian Robson, uh, people like Andy Cole But not the everyday man's footballing man And that was Matt Letizia Would you agree with the analysis that if you were to play today, it, w- it wouldn't work. No. <laughs> you think you would have worked harder in order to make it work, or ability yes. is ability in any generation? Uh, I, would, if, I would have done what was necessary to be a professional footballer. Uh, that was my dream as a kid, um, and that's all I ever wanted to do. Uh, and so I would have done whatever was necessary at the time to be a professional footballer. Was there, in some ways, an allergy to following the rules that was in your childhood that was nearly expressed in the way you played but also in the manner in which you didn't take the traditional path I mean it is I know you've said things like you just kind of weren't really arsed leaving Southampton and the difference in wage by going to a big club wouldn't be what it was today but it still was a strange decision and any gaffer who adopted a system that involved kind of breaking the code of how you expressed yourself on the pitch you didn't really, you didn't really <laughs> work under. I wasn't a conformist. Yeah, where where did that where did that come from? Um, where did that come Is from? Is it living in Guernsey in a kind of chilled out seaside town in which you Quite believe possibly? Just... Um, I think it also came out of um, uh, a, a, an unwavering belief in my own ability um, that I knew I was good at football and I knew what what I could do on a football pitch. But good at football is one thing. We meet those guys in the schoolyard. But go to football to the highest level and in a Premier League era where money is coming into it and Jurgen Klinsmann's on pitches and you're still chipping it up and kicking it against Wimbledon. No one else really had the audacity to do it. (laughs) That level of not giving a fuck is unique in sport. And it is something that has given you a cult status. And there'll be people in New York City who would associate you with the guy who didn't give a fuck. The Bob Marley (laughs) of football to an extent. Yeah. um, See, I always viewed football... Uh, as an entertainment industry, and I think that's what made me different from from a lot of other people. Uh, a lot of, the, uh, of other people were obsessed with winning. Um, I was never obsessed with winning. Did you ever care about winning? Yeah, I, I cared about winning, um, but I didn't obsess over it. Uh, what I what I obsessed over was trying to entertain people. Um, I always. When I watched football, I always wanted to see things that not everyone could do. Um, and I wanted to watch players that were a bit different to everyone else. Um, so my heroes growing up were people like Glenn Hoddle uh, and Liam Brady, um, guys like that who had unbelievable natural talent. Um, and I just wanted to play football the way that I knew I could play it, do things that other people couldn't do that and I knew they couldn't do. They didn't have the ability that I had. So if a new signing comes to Southampton in the 90s, do you give him, as a guy who's been in the dressing room for years, PFA Young Player of the Year 1990, do you tell him this is our goal for the season, this is where we want to finish, this is where we want to do in the cup competitions, or do you let him know here in Marion Pahars we're here to entertain? Because you would have become the lead figure in the dressing room and therefore to have your kind of lead figure, your Roy Keane, as a guy who isn't about winning and trophies he's about fan entertainment and the art of the game how did you translate that to people who signed us out and who wanted to win well firstly i didn't really become 
the the major force in the change room. At any point, even after all the time you spent there? Even when I was captain, I probably wasn't the strongest, loudest person in the change room. Uh, that was never my makeup, my character. Um, I kind of became captain by default, really. Um, we had a manager at the time called Ian Bramfoot, who was very unpopular with the fans. Um, they were calling him for, for him to be sacked for about 18 months. And he left me out of the team. Uh, he got a lot of stick for that. Uh, I came, he brought me back into the team because they went four or five games without winning when I wasn't playing. Um, and I came back into the team and that game was when I scored those two goals in Newcastle. Mm. Uh, and that was a big moment for me in my career. So I came back, scored those two cracking goals in the same game. We won the game. And then all of a sudden I was on a roll. I scored two in the next game as well, I think. And then went to Anfield, scored a couple. Um, but he was still under unbelievable pressure from the crowd. Uh, they wanted him out. The football he was playing was not entertaining football. It wasn't enjoyable to yeah. watch. It was pretty boring. Um, and I think his last act to try to save his job as manager and to try and garner favour with the fans was to make me captain, um, which didn't really work because four weeks after he made me captain, he got sacked. When you score that number of goals that are just stupid, I mean, people have top tens in which there's eight wonder goals and there's two kind of good team goals. But with you, there's there's great goals that aren't even spoken about because there's around 40 <laughs> stupid goals. Probably in the history of top flight football, since it's been colour television, no one has a better top 20 than Matt Letizia. Is that shit planned? How is it that <laughs> consistent? Are you there the night before going, I'm, I'm chipping it up or I'm... I'm aiming for that corner in a certain way. Uh, I d- I, How's the none aim of it was that really, good? None of it was really planned. Uh, I mean, you can't plan some of the stuff that that happens on a football pitch. I mean, you can plan a free kick. You know, the goal against Wimbledon. Yeah, where I flick it up and I've got. And I've got. Is it so night that, before so hotel room? So we we train uh, we practice that in training the day before, um, and I hit about twelve free kicks. I have to say, only about two of them went in. <laughs> um, but it was it was a good free kick. It was you know it was different. Um, uh, and when the free kick was actually given uh, against Wimbledon on the day, it was in such a nice position that I just kind of put the ball down. I thought I can score from here, direct from the free kick. Um, and then Jim Magilton, who um, who was stood by me at the free kick, he just turned to me and he went, why don't we try what we were practicing yesterday? And me being me, I just went, yeah, why not? So it was nil-nil at the time, about 12 minutes to go. Um, uh, and so he, he rolled the ball back to me. I, I flick it up and I catch it nice and sweet. And uh, it flies in the top corner. We win the game 1-0. What, um, what does it feel like when you know you've just scored a goal that people are making YouTube oh. careers out of when there's only a goalkeeper and no opposition? <laughs> and there's 20,000 people calling you Lagarde in a seaside town in which you reside? Mm. It was an unbelievable adrenaline rush when you score a goal like that. I mean, scoring any goal is good. It gives you it gives you a buzz. You know, when you see the crowd erupt, um, it is fantastic. Uh, when you score a, a goal that you know is going to be probably in the goal of the month contenders, yeah, um, and it's the winning goal. You you win the game one. It's the winning goal in the game. It makes it all that that bit more special. Did you know what you were doing with the character of Matt Letizia? The, the whole perception is it's minimum effort, maximum quality. I've gone down to five-a-side pitches, especially when I started throwing on the weight post kind of <laughs> terrible sports career. And if I scored a wonder goal, there's a Letitia gag around the place. <laughs> I, I've met 20 Letitias. Some of them are 40 stone. Did you know the everyday man hero? Like it, was, it was nearly movie-esque. When you had the armband on, you were lackadaisical, and it was just a flick, and it was effortless. Did you know what you were doing? The way I played football, it was just it was just who I was. Um, I was very instinctive uh, on a football pitch, so you know I reacted to stuff that was happening around me, uh, and I had an obsession that I I wanted to score goals. So uh, whenever I kind of got anywhere near uh, the goal, you know, thirty forty yards out from goal. Um, although I might be looking to pass to one of my, one of my teammates, always in the back of my mind is can I score from here? What can I do from here to, to score a goal? Um, and I always had that, that mindset. Um, I just loved scoring goals. Did you ever feel inferior to any team? Like, because Southampton would, would have times where they're losing 4-0, 3-0, you go six games without a win. Yeah. Did you always feel that you could be one of them if you wanted to be? 
Oh yeah, and it was easy to stick through the terrible times when Eric Cantona was coming to town and win the leagues. Yeah, yeah, no, um, you know, I think we once went. Uh, I think we went like nineteen or twenty games without a win once, um, and the manager kept his job. Imagine that, yeah. nineteen eighty-eight. We're talking about it. Yeah, um, but during you know even during that time, you know, I was I was pretty young at that point, um, so it was it was a little bit different, but. Whenever we went through poor spells, I knew because of the the way that football was um, that we would we would come out of it. We would come out of it, and that I could influence that. The big thing that follows you is the only having the eight England caps. Mm. Um, do you care about only having eight England caps, or was do not I actually care? being from England? <laughs> did that kind of take away from it a bit? Because it was such minimal effort to get more. Pick up a few more cones. Run a bit more. <laughs> but even even then, I'm not so sure. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing, I think, to to have won more England caps would have been to move, move clubs. So, uh, and was so it I, anything got to do with the fact that it was Hoddle and Venables and two, two gaffers who you'd rejected as a player to move to Tottenham and, and Chelsea? I don't know. Um, I would hope that they were bigger people than that, that they wouldn't hold it against me that I turned them down as club managers, that they wouldn't pick me as England manager and they did pick me they just didn't pick me very often um, so I, I I would hope it wasn't because of that um, but I think it was definitely something to do with the fact that I was playing in a team that were you know for the most part in the bottom half of the table fighting relegations um, and people who were playing at the top end of the table in the big teams were were at a massive advantage when it came to to England squads. What's it like meeting someone who's ahead of you who knows that they have around one tenth of your talent at, a, <laughs> at an award dinner? Or, no, but genuinely, like let's say you're talking about a Carlton Palmer or even like a, a Nicky Barnby or something like that, they know you're better than them. Mm. Do you find that people find no, you because, arrogant? No, because I um, I have always uh, respected anybody who was good enough to make a living in the top flight of professional football. Um, because you don't get there without having something about you. Mm. And that doesn't necessarily mean you've got the most ability in the world, um, but you've got something. It could be an ideology. It could be a bit between your two. You You know, you have an attitude about you. You have, um, you know, I played with guys at at Southampton. You know, one of my best mates is is Franny Benali. Franny would be the first person to admit he wasn't the most talented bloke in the world. Um, But I knew if we were on the last day of the season and we needed to keep a clean sheet to stay up I'd want him in my team Mm. because you know that he will drop everything for you he would throw his body in the way of anything he put his head in the way of anything um, and that's the kind of that's the kind of people you need and he had qualities about him that made him a professional footballer that I didn't have he had an unbelievable thirst for levels of fitness so he was is unbelievably fit in pre-season training. I never saw him. He was that far ahead of me in all the running. Um, but he knew he had to be that way to give him the best chance of having a career. And I've always respected those players that who didn't have all the ability that I had. But the deep but respect, the, like there is a different respect for talent over work rate. It, it's why we love rock and roll stars. Oh, yeah, it's, why, yeah. it's why we love Lennon and McCartney. They're doing LSD and they're still making that money off writing something. Yeah. There's something that is more kind of, that person's happier because they don't have to sacrifice any yeah. element of themselves to achieve their goal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right. There is different levels of respect. Um, you know, so so I would respect somebody like David Ginola or Dennis Bergkamp yeah. or Gianfranco Zola. Thierry Henry yeah you know I would respect those players uh, who's the best mixture you've seen Rooney oh the best mixture yeah Rooney I, I thought was incredible because he had that mixture of the ability and the the desire and the work and Fergie rate. Fergie and, was really a good guy to have for mm-hmm. making sure that he made Rooney feel like he was a lazy darts playing scouser who was going to throw it all away do you wish you played under Fergie um it would have been interesting yeah yeah would ever, have been ever a murmur of it uh, not really I think he did mention once when when Cantona retired yeah um that he thought about uh replacing him with me um but he'd 
he'd had it on good authority that I had no intention of leaving Southampton, so he didn't even bother making it. You would have went to the famous Man United, though, would you not? Nope. Would you not? No. No. Did Champions League football never appeal to you? Not really. <laughs> was there a safety net element to it, though? Um, like if you I don't really think there was a, a safety net element to it. I think what, uh, what it was w- with me at Southampton, there, there was two things. So... I quite enjoyed being the big fish in the small pond. So I, I liked But where does that, that enjoyment come from? It's the expectation. So I I liked the fact that people looked to me yeah. to produce uh, and to score the goals and to create the goals that were going to keep us up. So I, I liked being in the position of, of being able to be the hero. Yeah. You know, and I, I've never shied away from that. Uh, I've from always... a psychological point of view, though, is that an egomaniac we're talking about there? There's probably a little bit of ego in that, um, but the other the other part of that is, um, which, which is completely contradicts that. Really, is that I always felt like I owed Southampton something. In terms of all I ever wanted to do as a kid was be a professional footballer. Southampton gave me that opportunity to be a professional footballer. So I felt like I owed them. Um, And I don't think I could have lived with myself if I'd have left Southampton and they'd have got relegated. I'm not saying that would have happened, but there was probably a bigger chance of it happening with me not being there. It would have. There were seasons where you stayed up on goal difference. There was multiple seasons where you stayed up within a win or a draw. Hmm. So I wouldn't have been comfortable with that. Would you take, I would have felt like that was my fault. Would you take games more seriously when the dog fight was on than you would in October? Yes. Like that, but that's, is that not unprofessional <laughs> in ways? Well, no, it's not, it's, it's not unprofessional. It's not that I didn't... It's not that you don't... You nearly wanted it's not the that dog you don't fight. Try, it's not that you don't try in October. It's just that you're more relaxed in October. Fergie wouldn't allow you. Yeah, but their expectations were completely different to ours. Did you not want nine months of stress? You didn't want to be a Wall Street stockbroker. You wanted to be an artist. You wanted to be a painter. I wanted to be an entertainer. I wanted to entertain people. So during that time, it didn't. It, those games, the results of those games, you know, weren't really, really crucial. And but they kind of are. Some, and some seasons, you had a time where there was no relegation scrap at the end of it. Um, and it was just a nice, smooth ride through the season, picking up enough points. Um, but those times when you didn't pick up enough points, and there could be multiple reasons for that, um, when you got in those situations at the end of the season where you needed to pull out some results. Let, let's not forget, it's not just me in this team. I've got 10 other people with me. Um, and for for all the people that, that might say, oh, well, it was a, it was a one-man team, you can't, you, you can't have a one-man team in football. I cannot do, I could not do, a lot of the things on a football pitch that other people I needed around me to do for me. Everyone struggles with the notion of people telling them they're not kind of maximising their ability. It's one of the banes of life, regardless of your industry. If people coming up, whether it's a sibling, a family member, a wife, a girlfriend, you could be there. You must have got that every night. You must have had even Saints fans coming up to you going, that this, we're cool with you winning first division titles. You're too good for us. Um, no, not really. Not really. And, and the whole thing about maximising your potential. See, that I think a lot of the time there's a lot of projection going on there. So people who criticise you for, for not maximising your mm. potential are probably people that haven't ever maximised their potential. And they project that onto you to make themselves feel better. Yeah. Whereas in my life, I know what my ambitions in life were. Uh, and I know what my priorities in life were. And I, my two ambitions in life from a kid was to be a professional footballer and play for England. And I achieved both of them. The fact that it was only eight times doesn't matter. Someone taught you the, the notion of loyalty. Because um, it's not, not everyone respects. There's some people who no. do not give a shit. They can change personalities every two years. It's getting more common now in Instagram culture. In fact, Matt Letizia is the opposite to what's preached to us via Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook nowadays, which is um, have your oats, have your coffee, work out, uh, get your dopamine in. <laughs> it's a, a celebration of work and a complete put down of talent is the culture we're now in. Yep. You get someone to show up and do Geordie Shore uh, 10 years ago, that's completely snowballed into something of a different level. 
And getting up early in the morning and making a fool of yourself is actually more noble now and rewarded more financially than people who have talent and who want to sit down and make some real art. Yeah, life's great, isn't it? But this isn't a, <laughs> this isn't a world for you. It's not a world for me, no. It's not the world that I wanted to live in. Uh, to be honest, I've only ever really wanted to be left alone in this world, quite frankly. Um, I've only ever wanted to play my sport. Yeah, I love sport, not just football. Do you like rugby? No, I said sport. Do you like cricket? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was good at cricket. Do you like basketball? If I, if I Do you respect football, basketballers? Yeah, I, I played basketball as a kid. Uh, I quite enjoyed that game. But like, would you think LeBron James is a phenomenal athlete? Oh, yeah, there's yeah. some phenomenal athletes in basketball. Absolutely. Now, Michael Jordan was incredible. But yeah, you just wanted to be left the fuck alone. So I wanted to be left alone in my life to play my sport and just be happy. I just wanted to be happy. Uh, I've always found from a young age, um, my, uh, my uncle once gave me a bit of advice, which is always stuck in my mind since I was a kid. Because uh, I don't know what, how he said it or uh, why it resonated so much. But he said something and it stuck with me the whole time. And he said, we're here for a good time, not a long time. Mm. And those words have always stuck with me. And I've tried just to have a nice, relaxed life. Um, you know, the world's people. a bit fucked up when the kind of violent left wing are now no longer coming for conservatives, but they're coming for people who want peace. Yes. It's incredible, isn't it? Um, which shows that it has got so corrupted that it has become fascism to an extent that has become um something that did um represent the extreme right wing 60 70 years ago and that that is a theme that is now occurring you're seeing people who yep. do want to be left alone who aren't trying to hurt people's feelings i mean the russia tweet came across probably wrong i i so the the thing with the <laughs> the whole point of what I was trying to make there, and I and it was clumsy. It was and, just media and, trust, and I admit it was. Don't believe everything that you see mm. or hear on the television, because in times of war, propaganda will be used by both sides. But in terms of that actual particular issue, you hadn't given much thought to whether or not you thought that that kind of slaughter was true. So, uh, so the point I was making was <laughs> should have been made with probably a less emotive subject. As, yeah. the, as the tweet that I quoted. if uh, So I, so that's when I held my hands up and went, I, I, I probably messed up there. But the, like, a tweet is two seconds of thought as well. People act as if a tweet is a fucking thesis. It's a guy sitting <laughs> having a coffee in his kitchen exactly. that just goes, fuck like, it. Uh, yeah, yeah, don't believe everything you read in the media, blah, blah, But blah, you probably do underestimate again. what 500,000 followers means, and it's probably the same reason that you underestimate what you'd mean to fans. Where you don't give a... Like, for example, if Xavi talked about coming home from school and watching me score goals. I don't even know what I think I am. I wouldn't have the kind of discipline of the, uh, of the ego to not think I'm better than people. But I'm an immature guy. I have less years than you, but you don't really give a shit. So you probably misread the fact that now people are so obsessed with uh, the idea of 15 minutes of fame and, and importance that these kids, these 28-year-olds who want to be influencers, think you think you're famous. They think you think you matter. They overrate what you think yourself. Absolutely. And do. that's what Absolutely. gets you in trouble. It you does. just sent out a tweet, used the wrong fucking thing, and now Leticia is trying to spread right wing shit. It's <laughs> insane. I know. I don't even know I don't even know the difference between right wing and left wing. I've I've never been politically minded in my life at all. Yeah. Never would have even considered a guy being black, white, any of that shit. You just would have wouldn't have crossed your mind. Not one bit. Not one bit. It's it's <laughs> It, it's just bizarre the world that we live in where people just try to stick labels on you. I, I got I got called an anti vaxxer This is the best one. I got called an anti vaxxer because for this particular vaccine, I've decided to wait a bit for some long term safety data and make my mind up when I've seen that that data. Right? I've had every other vaccination mm. in my life, right? And because I've chosen to wait a little bit. All of a sudden, I'm now an anti-vaxxer. I'm like, where are you, where do you people get off in life trying to label somebody? It shouldn't really matter to anybody whether you 
or Aaron Rodgers or fucking Kyrie Irving or anybody chooses whether or not to have something put into their body. Absolutely. You found yourself in a position which is the exact opposite to what you wanted to be, which was a chilled out guy who in a way avoided the Tottenham and the Chelsea's and maybe even the Man United's because you just didn't want the fucking paparazzi. No. You knew playing with Beckham, that's nearly dangerous. I wasn't obsessed. I wasn't obsessed with being famous. I didn't want what to about be money? more famous. What about I didn't money? want to be I didn't I played football because I loved football and I wanted to entertain people. But you could have quite your salary. Care how much money I was earning. I did that I literally did not play football for money. That wasn't what I was there for. But if would, footballers had got paid less than a plumber, I'd have still been a footballer. Do you think it's that it's your realness and actual strength of principles which has made you a target? Yeah. Hundred percent. They don't. They, they they don't like people like me. They don't like people because who talk, actually have an ideology they, they and do sacrifice wage and salary. They don't like people who can think for themselves uh, and who will stick to their principles. What do you do now? What do you do to I kind do of hide? Now? No, I don't hide. I'm doing a live stream on Getter this evening. Uh, so I've moved across. I'm kind of just fading off of Twitter because it's a toxic hellhole uh, most of the time, to be honest, uh, full of bots and trolls. And uh, it's not a very nice place to, to be. Um, so I, I've um, uh, set up on Getter, um, which is a, a fairly new social media platform um, which allows for free speech competition with twitter which allows for free speech but what know. do you do on getter what do i do same as i was doing on twitter just get a completely different reaction from the people so you, do you just make statements or is it you said live stream that like you're I'm doing live stream yeah i'm doing i do a weekly live stream um, and, do you get, do and you i get, take questions from do you, you get money who, for it yeah what would you say to their argument that you're now cashing in on a kind of alternative viewpoint now all I want to be is left alone by my government to live my life. Uh, so, so you're doing I this for the sake to, of free speech. I still have to pay my mortgage. Yeah. Uh, but I I am also very strongly strongly in favour of free speech, uh, and I think it's something that we have to fight with for our lives with because once you lose that. We're in a very, very bad Let's say they place. do win, which is looking, in fairness to the world, that does tend to figure shit out. When, when a proper evil gets to the tipping point, the fact that we're floating around the globe and we don't know why we're here tends to fight back, and our mystery of existence does tend to allow us to continue to go on. Even Elon Musk trying to take over Twitter, he is an advocate of free speech to an extent, so there is kind of positives there. But let's say they did kind of win, and you could cancel the Twitter's of people who have a stance, even someone like Katie Hopkins, absolute fucking, I mean, deliberately offensive attention seeker, but you can't, you can't just block out her voice. Just don't care no, about her voice. Exactly. That's, you, this is the thing that I was at. I spoke to somebody a, a, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and, and I, I said to him, if somebody's idea is so repugnant and so immoral, so their opinion is so bad, you've still got to let them say it, yeah. But then, but then you can choose what you do with that opinion. You yeah. go, oh well, that opinion's stupid. I'm going to ignore and that. And it's not like the opinion has power. This is a 1960s no. Birmingham Marches in which some guy is going on air saying, "I don't want black people in the country," and he actually has the decision making ability to do it. Katie Hopkins is just ranting. Exactly. Even Graham Linhan, previous guest of the show, he is at the end of the day just making, but they can't even hear it. So it's nearly like a brainwashing of the overall public. If they had achieved that, what do humans do then? When everyone's on the same page, is it just a warm up for just being completely bought over by technology and just becoming robots to consumerism? Really, I think, I think that's that's what it is. That the goal? All the evidence is pointing towards going in that direction. That that's, that's the goal what, is to make us people who can't take emotional conflict powerless. Yeah, to money. It's the aged capitalism. Characters like you from the 90s and even rock and roll bands who genuinely... Like Liam, how, how much money did Liam Gallagher cost his record label with his behaviour by just wanting to be a rock and roller? Now it's Ed Sheeran. Now it's someone who's clean cut. Now every footballer, footballers don't have opinions anymore and their performance isn't even analysed as long as they're politically on the right side. Yeah. And as a Manchester United fan, hmm. I believe Marcus Rashford falls into that category. Um, what's he still doing there just as a, just from a football point of view I mean based on the season he's had the 18 months he's had he is and the fact that he never really kicked on to the next level as yep. like a, 
he's someone traditionally Manchester United would now look for you're, you're, you're 35 million for yep absolutely but because he has a political narrative yep he it's, uh, a, different, it's a different world because he has a, a political world. narrative he's uh, he's allowed just to be rated as a, as a footballer yeah so what's it's, the it's fucking all, point, Matt? It's it's. But you're very lucky the age you're at. It does seem, yeah, yeah. I, I because know. you've had your adrenaline hits, you have your legacy, and at the end of the day, a cranky old man is a much better guy to be than somebody who's disillusioned with the current setup and someone who's a huge football fan as well. Traditionally, I really, really love football. What it represents, how it brings people together, and actually, the sport in general is a very funny concept. Eleven guys, there's two goals, offs, all that shit. <laughs> Top flight football's ruined. Um, I see where you, I, I see why you think that, and I think there's a lot of people who think the same way as you. Um, what do you I think? certainly don't have the same affection uh, for, for it as, for as, as I used to do. For even Southampton, um, probably um, for football in general. Um, I, I feel like once politics got involved uh, in the Premier League, my interest level declined and politics never decided to get involved when it was a case of football fans being anti-Tory government being anti-Thatcher being in the terraces uh, representing the working club politics was fucking bailing on football then and it was uh, citing hooliganism yeah. if anything yeah. in parliament but once it became popular politics it all got its hands sudden, all over the all Premier League sudden, they're all over it and, and once it became a tourism attraction and once the money was massive and once you had to claim you're a Villa West Ham fan if you're fucking David Cameron whatever the fuck it became popular and people are falling for it and people, people fall, that's the that's the I think that's the the worst bit about it or the most frustrating bit about it is that people don't see through the bullshit what I also don't understand, especially when people say things like, hey, Matt, Matt Letitia is now a conspiracy theorist and have cancelled numerous other people, even Johnny Depp's been attempted to be cancelled at one point he's fighting back, is that how don't they understand that in every tragedy that the, the, the human life has ever experienced, the masses have been brainwashed? Yep, absolutely. And we don't learn from history. It's incredible. Why would, why would people who agree with everyone think they're right? <laughs> it's a mental, isn't it? It is mental. You know, I can't remember who it was that said, when you find yourself on the side of the majority, you need to step back and take And the a, funniest thing, a, though, is, is, is that the left have always viewed themselves as anti-money, anti-chasing the dough. Yet now everybody who opposes them is clearly and, taking a financial sacrifice. Absolutely. And also, when you're looking at people like Matt Letizia or people who never valued things such as materialism whilst they express their craft and their art, in a way... And I know you said you've no interest in left and right, but as you played football, there was a Che Guevara element to the way you played the fucking game. You were a socialist footballer. It was everyone's. That wonder goal was everyone's. I'm doing this in a Southampton jersey because I want to share it with you. I could do it in a Chelsea jersey, but it just wouldn't feel the same. Uh, it's, yeah, it is an interesting uh, interesting concept, but I've, I've, I've never really thought that deeply about it. Um, you know, I was, I was just going about my life doing what I was good at, having fun and having a good time until two years ago. What happened with the um, the iconic Soccer Saturday lineup? Was that just they've had their day or was it you four white men get them out the fucking door? Um, I think it was a combination of things. Um, I think there was definitely a, a change of direction in terms of the way the company was going with the on-screen talent. I'm all for proportional representation mm. on television, absolutely. Yeah, because te television is a representation of society. It, so, should, so it, it should be. But why was, that, be, but why was that four split up if it was kind of a, a therapeutic experience for all watchers come uh, 12 o'clock on a Saturday? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think if, if something's not broke, you shouldn't try fixing it. Um, were you guys shocked? Charlie and Phil were probably not so shocked um, because I think Phil had already spoken to Sky uh, and they were kind of talking about phasing out because... Uh, Phil was uh, getting into his sixties. Mm. Um, Charlie must have must have been quite shocked, I think, because I don't think he saw that coming. I don't think any of us saw it coming. I, I kind of, I kind of saw it coming because I'd had a couple of uh, issues with my social media content that they weren't particularly happy yeah. about. Um, 
So it wasn't a, a massive shock to me. Uh, was it as good fun as it looked, meeting up with the four boys and talking about oh, football? Oh, it was brilliant fun. It was brilliant fun. And Just we're completely doing, taking the piss for four doing, hours. Yeah. And, and we paid for it. We're doing some, uh, we do some theatre shows now as well. So we do we do a live theatre evenings with us. So we, we do get back together again. Um, so we've got another five or six coming up at the back end of the year. So... They're good fun, and we we just kind of roll back into how we used to be. What Stelling does is probably one of the most underrated jobs in world broadcasting. If you look at the instantaneous ad lib nature of what he's doing, he could be a stand up comedian. Absolutely, he could be a news reader in any generation. It's uh, absolutely phenomenal if you consider how his mind's working. Incredible. Um, when Incredible you went in talent. there first, when you looked at him live, is he just is he kind of just locked in? Or would, um, he, would he have in between? Is he still having banter? No, no, he's still having banter in between. Um, but there are moments when you know you can't talk to him because he's got a lot. He's got a lot coming, a lot of information coming in that he's got to process. Uh, so we know when we can take the mickey out of him. Um, and we know when to leave him alone for a few minutes because he's there's too many goals have gone in and he can't write them all down on his bits of paper that he's got in front of him. And then even kind of the drag in of Chris Kamara as a kind of comedic foil, like it became. It became a soap opera. It was just mm. brilliant writing. It was Stelling behind all of that nearly? Um, well, that's a good question. Like, like, like how Cammy became Cammy? Was, without, no, I without, think that was just Cammy's personality. But does Cammy work without Stelling being the antagonist of Cammy's ridiculousness? Ah, that's a good question, actually. That's a good question. Because it is so art. It is, is entertainment. It is. it is TV. Yeah, I mean, we analyze Curry characters. I want to analyze fucking Gillette Soccer Saturday characters. Yeah, no, I, yeah, it's a fair point actually. And it is a great combination the two of them, um, and it has developed over over a long period of time. Yeah, it really has. It's Very just, well it's scouted like, the way well, they always did. Even if you go back to the Rodney Marsh era, and he obviously got fucked over because he said that uh, ridiculous line about when. The tsunami was coming. David Beckham thought they were talking about the Newcastle fans. They Georgie Best, the effortless, uh, brilliant kind of genius. And then they kind of got you in. They got Phil Thompson, who'd won a lot. I was actually the beneficiary of Rodney making that joke live did on air. You, did you? So I was only uh, like a an occasional stand-in before then. Uh, and then when Rodney got sacked, that's when Sky came to me and said, can you do every week? So I was actually um, quite fortunate that Rodney did that. Uh, and, and I was in the right place at the right time to, to take advantage of that and spend the next 15 years on the show. So Your knees get weak, your quads lose muscle density, but the brain stays in the same head. How do you remain a happy man if you are an athlete who prided himself solely on being an athlete? You could go to any coffee shop, restaurant or bar in this town tonight and of people licking your arse. <laughs> well, that's what you could do, and there's a lot of people who would do that. There's people who are members of golf clubs and take pride in being the captain, even though they're shooting 16 <laughs> over. And they show up, and, they, and, and their wife wears a visor, and they wear the jumper, and they have a little meeting, and there's 20 <laughs> people applauding them, and they feel, Jesus, I'm going to go back into the bank on Monday, and I'm going to feel good about myself, and my, my son will join the golf club after me. <laughs> are you less happy now than you were when you were Matt Letizia? Does aging affect you? I'm still Matt Letizia. You know? Yeah, I know you're still <laughs> Matt Letizia. But the so Matt... I never, uh, so the one thing I never did uh, was take myself too seriously. Um, you know, as a footballer, I knew what my deficiencies were, but I also knew what my strengths were. Um, but as a but man. I, but I, I also knew where I came from. Um, uh, I had a family that ensured that I, I kept my feet on the ground, um, which is something that I'd always done. I never hid myself away, uh, even at the, the height of like the mid-90s where, um, you know, I was, I was scoring 25, 30 goals mm. a season. I would still walk around this town. League goals as I well. Would like, still, what, 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 what did you get, 25 in 95? 25 in 93, 94. And then you got 20 in 90. That's when you won Young Player of the Year. I did. You, you got 19 in 91. Yeah. You got 20 again after the 25. I did, yeah. 30 that season. I scored 10 in the Cups that year as well in 95. Yeah, it's just stupid. So, But even then, even during that period of time, um, <clears> I would still always... I wouldn't lock myself away. I'd, I'd go into town. I'd eat in restaurants in town. I'd walk around the shops. And I've never hidden myself away. So I've always been somebody who's tried to live as normal a life as possible. Surely it was tough, though. No. 
In no, a town like Southampton, was there not people just completely no. ruining your night? You're no. sitting at a bar, there's 40 people coming up going, how did you love Tim Flowers? How did you <laughs> love Schmeichel? Uh, it, it wasn't that many people for a start. And most people were really polite. Uh, and I always had, uh, I was born with a lot of patience. Um, and I appreciated very early on that for me to be a footballer, I have to have a stadium with people in for me to be able to entertain them. Uh, and without those people, what I was doing would be pretty pointless. So why wouldn't I give them 60 seconds of my time? Did you ever think you were better than anyone? As a footballer? Or no, as, as, a as a person for being somebody who's making a living off doing something that is fun. Did you ever like no, I, I, internally patronise people going, no. you're chasing something that's not going to make you happy? You think that car, you think that house, you think that life. No, I don't judge You don't love people. your life. You don't judge. I don't judge other people. Um, I've always just felt incredibly lucky that I was able to have a job where well, I got paid for playing my hobby basically uh, and I've always been incredibly felt incredibly lucky and incredibly grateful that I was able to do that for 17 years as somebody who is kind of so open-minded and understands the complexities of the human brain have you ever considered drugs on a recreational level nope never considered smoking weed nope Never, though. No. Why? Never interested me. Didn't need it. The exploration Happy of the mind, enough without though. it. Would you drop a stamp of acid? No. No. Just for the crack? No. Nope. What about alcohol? I didn't need it. Uh, I, have, uh, I, I have the occasional uh, drink of alcohol now, um, but I, I don't drink beer, don't drink wine. Um, so what if, do you drink? If I have a drink now, my, my choice of drink is... Um, Malibu and Coke. Why? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, because it tastes nice. Food or something you enjoy? It's the only... Yeah, I love food. Do you enjoy, do you enjoy eating I garbage? Love, you like sugar, garbage you like food. salt? I love garbage Would Matt Letizia still order a Domino's pizza the other time? Yeah. Would you, yeah? Oh, yeah. What would you get? Um, I have the... I, I create my own, as you would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> But it's but it's uh, it's not particularly special. Uh, so I like uh, mushrooms, I like uh, chicken strips, um, and I like lots of cheese. Okay, so fast food was that was your addiction. You uh, couldn't have given up food to be a top a top top Ferguson trained player. Uh, I would have done. Did you uh, ever give up grub for the game? I would. Uh, yeah, I had to. <laughs> I had to temper what I ate a little bit because I, I certainly as I got older in the last few years I tended to put on weight quite easily if I wasn't careful um, so uh, to put that into context uh, when I finished playing when I retired at 33 young retirement yeah, yeah you didn't young. have the I couldn't had... do what I used to be able to do yeah um, so when I retired at, at 33 I carried on eating the same amount of food that I was eating as if I was training. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And within two months of retiring, I put on two stone. Jesus. <laughs> when, when, when we talk about someone, I have a particular Premier League all-time 11, but as I'm saying, like as I, I view myself as a guy who's knowledgeable of football, but as I said, I, I can't explain to how low the level of football I played was. <laughs> like, I, I cannot, you wouldn't even believe how low the level was. But my all-time Premier League 11 is something I, I'd like you to, to consider as someone who had both ability and knowledge. Okay. I go Edwin van der Sar. Just because I think he's complete, because I think he could use both feet. He was the first goalkeeper post-pass back who had to have the responsibility on his feet, but he had that old-school shield and ability of positioning and shot-stopping. People say Schmeichel, people say Czech. You've Ederson and Allison now. I don't think anyone's a better goalkeeper than Edwin van der Sar, who's played in the Premier League. I think you make a very compelling argument for him, yeah. Yeah. Would you agree I would with disagree that? disagree with that, yeah. Huh? I think neither of us can disagree with the fact that Ashley Cole has to be left back. Uh, I don't think there's any real issue there. Um, I mean, when you think about people like Stuart Pearce, mm -hmm. uh, I think Ashley Cole took the fullback position. To a new place. To a new Technically place. Technically better and was also tough. <laughs> uh, Centre back for me, John Terry has to be in there. You cannot argue it. Uh, yep. He was Bobby Moore, yep. but technically better. Um, I have Rio beside him with Van Dyke getting close to rivaling that now. 
but just for longevity and number of leagues won Van Dijk only has one Rio kind of has to be in there in a way doesn't he see, I see that's part of the that I'd have to disagree with when you're choosing best players but you bought in trophies okay but let's just say semi-final in the Champions <laughs> League with Leeds let's say his performances at West Ham getting into that 98 squad that you weren't put in and, and I'll come back to the 11 did you think when Glenn Hoddle got your one involved with the fate healing because you're a guy as I said who seems clear of mind did you just think this is bollocks and the other boys just weren't really commenting on it and you I don't even want to be picked for that fucking freak show <laughs> Um, I didn't. I didn't really comment on it. Um, he asked me to go and see her. I I, I needed a hernia operation, um, uh, and so I was I was struggling a little bit. And he asked me to go and see her, but I knew I was going to have an operation at the end of the season because I'd had one the previous season and it worked perfectly. I was back training within like four weeks or something, uh, so I knew what the operation was and I knew how long it was going to take me to get back. I could get through to the end of the season. It was a bit uncomfortable, but nothing I couldn't couldn't cope with. So. I was all sorted in my head. I'll, I'll just play the rest of the season. I'll get the operation done. So when he said, I'll oh, go and see her, she might be able to sort it out for you. And I was like, actually, I know what it is and I know what's going to happen at the end of the season. And four weeks later, I'll be fine. I'll play the next season. It's great. I'm all good. So I didn't think anything of it. I didn't think he would be offended by that. And I don't know Why if he is was there articles who that? claim that you were anti the faith healer? Because people, journalists just make shit up for the job, is what you're saying. Pretty much, yes. So most of the shit ever written about you is a lie. Uh, I don't know if, if most of the, the stuff written about me was a lie, uh, but there was quite a few bits that were completely not... Some stuff in there about transfers and things. Yeah. You know, there's a, I've seen journalists do articles saying that uh, I've been house hunting in Newcastle <laughs> or house hunting in Blackburn. I've been spotted in Blackburn. And I was like... You're talking shit. I've did, not been to did, Blackburn. Did they ever get involved in your personal life? I know you were a Southampton player, so obviously you didn't have the same kind of microscope. Did they ever get involved in relationships and that shit? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I left my wife um, when I was 28. Um, and there was uh, a bit of controversy around that. What do you mean by left my wife? I left my, I, I left my wife. So um, I, I met what is now my current wife. Yeah. Um, they try to make it out as if it's a young one, it's a fling, and he's turned his back on his kids. Kind of bullshit. Yes. Yeah, all that stuff. Did that narrative that they had ever give you a motivation to prove them wrong? And that's the reason why you're still in the relationship with the current wife? Or no, it's genuine love. And does love exist? That's another <laughs> question. Does love exist? <laughs> that's a very good question. Does it? What is it? Is who, it who is it? What is, is it? It's, is, it's a feeling. Is it suitability, though? Is it suitability? It could be. I, I guess I could be described as suitability. Um, but I think there's probably something a bit deeper than that. Um, but that's a that's a whole new topic. That but what, just that, that could go to levels where you just like were they I, inaccurately I probably, I probably don't understand. Were they inaccurately describing the circumstances in which you, as you would put it, left your wife? Did they try and make it seem like Guernsey childhood sweetheart? He thinks he's too big for his boots. Yeah, now yeah. he's gone off. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And what was it like to yeah. deal with? Is it is it funny or is it still painful? Uh, do you know what? It's actually more painful to the people around me um as has been kind of the last the last few weeks yeah it's always more painful for you know my wife um probably my parents um because i i see it for what it is um and they see they see the reaction of people and they have people you know coming up to them going oh are you, are you okay you yeah. know, Matt's taking a bit of a hammering is he okay and then they start going oh oh blimey I sh should I be worried about him like, but actually do you know what I'm absolutely fine don't worry about me I'm good as gold and uh, you have no reason to be concerned I try reassuring my parents and my and my family that, that they're I'm not an absolute nutcase I'm absolutely <laughs> of sound mind and that just because the criticism doesn't affect me doesn't mean I'm uh, you know, uh, a psychopath. Uh, it just means that I know that I believe in what I'm saying. And when you feel like you have the truth on your side, then criticism means absolutely yeah. zero to me. Left wife. Why do you put it in a way that suggests that you were the kind of contributor of betrayal as opposed to just been a normal formatting of life? Um, well, I, I left her. I left the home. So I left the family what home. What does that mean, though? You pack up your shit and I go, or you, shit and there's went. a series of conversations in which you say, I don't know if I'm feeling this anymore. I packed up my shit and went. 
Um, do you regret kind of doing it in such a... I, I regret doing it, though I, I should have... I was in an unhappy marriage. I should have left my wife without somebody else being involved. That's the one thing I regret in my life. Did you leave your wife because somebody else was involved? Did I leave my wife because somebody else was involved? I left my wife because I was unhappy. I wasn't happy in my marriage. You might got married at 21, though. Yeah, really young, yeah. I wouldn't Three recommend... years of legal drink serving. I wouldn't recommend uh, really to anybody uh, getting married that young. I think marriage is something that needs to be... Um, I don't believe in it. Something... Uh, Full and, stop. Yeah, what does I, it mean? I what does it mean? Yeah, I don't... I, I can understand that point of view. Um, I can completely understand that. Um, but I, if you are going to make that commitment to somebody, um, then I... I, I don't think I would recommend doing it quite so young. And also, if we, we have a contract in every other area of our life, and that can be from paying a toll bridge to a professional career. And even when a baby's born, we still have to have the, the hospital nearly know the baby before you fucking do it. <laughs> yeah. It's not even yours. It's theirs, and they gift it to you. It came out of your wife's fanny and your dick, but we're giving it to you. <laughs> Marriage is the one thing that doesn't need a contract. It doesn't. It, it has yeah. the... If you're going to have any trust, loyalty, and all that exists between human-to-human relationships, so they're going back to the caveman days. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, I get that. I can get on board with that. I think that's something that could work. How many children do you have? Three. And as time goes on, when you hear about all these kind of fallouts, and even if people have spoken to the papers, does it all just become peaceful eventually? Does life tend to... Yeah. Yeah, the waves just diminish. And yeah. it just becomes a case of you were young, I was young, we all grew up together. Yeah. And we've arrived I, I at this point. Was, I mean, I don't think my, my first wife will ever really um, forgive for for what happened and we'll never be uh we'll never be probably mates she she knows that for um, how many years was it so she when when we split up uh she actually moved back to guernsey because she was from guernsey as well um and so for the next 15 years um i i flew back to guernsey even while i was playing i would fly back to guernsey every sunday uh, and spend the day with the kids on the Sunday. And I did that for 15 years. So she knows that I, I didn't not, not care about my children. How common is adultery in, in Top Flight Footy? Is it just hard to avoid? Obviously, I can't speak for, for the, the group of people now. I can only speak for, for the time that I was a footballer and the, uh, and the changing room that I was in. <laughs> um, but I, I would say it was probably somewhere around 70, 80%. We're cheating. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd expect that. But again, it's a very misogynistic viewpoint. I mean, the concept of a wagon itself is very backward, isn't it? Yes. Female football, you'd be an advocate of that shit. I had uh, the American female team minus one in the World Cup final two years ago, and they were, they were brilliant to watch. <laughs> There is an arrogance there. There is a patriarchy that still exists, and we do kind of think we're doing them a favour by allowing female football to exist. When Why, I do, shouldn't they, why shouldn't they exist? I think we should make more of an effort to make it more important. Do you not think they're, they're, not, do you not think they're making an effort for it with the coverage that they're getting? Mm. But I still believe there's an undertone of blokes who feel like this has been forced down our face and are politicising an issue. Sometimes things aren't just a woke culture. Sometimes we actually do need to deal with the fact that females should have the mechanism to express themselves via sport. I've not really noticed. I think what um, what I think is probably going on is that it's it's suddenly got a lot of coverage. But it doesn't have a lot of spectators. There's a misogyny beyond belief to football, though. Like, I mean, if you look at the actual physical appearance of every woman who's ever presented Sky Sports, Talk Sport, anything, they look like they've after crawling out of Baywatch, <laughs> where you have these blokes sitting there like Charlie Nicholas and Matt Letizia. <laughs> you know what I mean? There, Absolutely. There yeah, is yeah. an undertone Absolutely. of, like, we need the entertainment of the beautiful woman. I, I don't recall a non physically beautiful woman being involved in football media in my experience of watching it. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if you disagree with that comment, you then start, you then think, start talking no, about... No, I think that's a... To I think that's, I think that's quite Gray a huge extent, though. sweeping generalisation. It's a, it's but a, I'm very <laughs> pleased that you didn't have to be good-looking to have a career in media as a bloke. <laughs> No, it's a fascinating tail off, but we're still on this 11. So I'm going John Terry. I'm going Rio. Okay, Who see, I would go Van Dyke. 
I, I think Van Dijk's the best centre back to play. Oh no, he's with. he's fabulous. He was unbelievable at Southampton, and obviously you have that you have that reason. Uh, Vidic, we putting him in it's just as a conversation. Stan, um, Tony Adams. Vidic, Vidic and, by the way, Saul Campbell was a joke, man. Yeah, yeah. I think Kyle Walker's right back now, and I think that's just that's just fact. It used to be right backs always where the Premier League struggled. I think I think you're right. I think we. I mean. There was not a there was not a history of loads of world class right. There just wasn't, and it was Spain kind of decided what a fullback became, and yeah. Brazil decided, and we just followed. Yeah. So um, the Marcelos and all these guys, the Cafus and Carlos's, they decided what you became. It, yeah. Trent Alexander Arnold, for example, is just a he's just a knock on really of what the South Americans told us a fullback needed to do. Absolutely. So we were struggling for years. We had Gary Neville. I go Walker now, just just due to. So we would agree then on. Van der Sar, Cole, Terry, Van Dyke, Walker. There's nowhere near enough United in here. Uh, <laughs> I, I think Skulls has to be in there. I, I believe he does. You're a footballer. Um, you're a gifted footballer. How does Matt Letizia perceive Skulls? That's interesting to me. Because yeah, he was effortless. It is interesting because he was a he was a top class footballer. Um, but there were there are a lot of top class midfielders that have played in the Premier League. I think. He was the focal point of such constant, consistent success. Yeah. Who would you have? But again, uh, it's when uh, when you're choosing a best eleven. That, that's twice <clears> you've done it now. I've noticed that you, you talk about the constant success. Now that success is born from a team. That when, success is born the epi, from when one, you're the epicenter of it, Matt. But it, but a team isn't one player. A team is a, a makeup of a whole load of different players so with a you, whole load of different characteristics. So give me your two midfielders. Um, Can't they? For effectiveness, league at Leicester, it, then league at the, Chelsea. This is the this is the thing when you when you're doing this, you firstly have to have a formation. Um, just for time, let's do four four two. Just based off how many years the four four two was popular. Okay, so so really in a four four two. I don't think you would have Kante in there. Now, if you're playing four two three one, mm. I think that's a different ball game. Um, but there was, I mean, Roy Keane has to be in a in a best eleven. Let's a, do four, four two. Four, no, four, no, no, two. because we're putting Van Dijk in and Walker. Let's do four two three one. I still don't see how Skulls is, is not in the team. The guy could play. Oh, I'm not any... saying he's. I'm not saying he's not in the team. I'm just saying there's there was a lot of good midfielders around. Um, you know, you will talk about Lampard and Gerrard and De Bruyne. The midfield's going to take is, a while. Is it where? Is it who? Rooney off Henri. Right. So you wouldn't have the Premier League's Shearer. greatest goal scorer. Oh, yeah, in the team. I just think if you actually, <laughs> if, but but obviously Alan Shearer, Jesus Christ, the respect from us through the roof. What he did as a footballer is beyond belief. But I, I do not believe, and I could be wrong, who the fuck am I? I do not believe he was a better football player or made you more likely to win on any level of football, highest European stage, than either Wayne Rooney or Thierry Henry. I, 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 I just, I know he was a great goal scorer. He was brilliant. He was yeah. so consistent. I genuinely think they were both fucking, do you know what I mean? They were the Rolling Stones. They were the top level of their industry. I think, I think Wayne Rooney has more natural football ab- ability than... Alan Shearer. And had seasons in which he got the 30s. Mm. He proved it. He proved that if he wanted to kind of not get involved in the game and have the discipline to be centre forward, he'll get yep. those goals. Rooney, and how can you leave Henri out? I mean, the electricity. No, you can't leave Henri out. Henri was the best player I played against in the Premier League. Yeah. You were probably a bit older then, though, so probably kind of thought his pace was a bit more frightening than it, it should have been if you were five years younger. <laughs> well, Skull's not up there. Uh, you kind of thought you could do what he did. I, 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 if you're asking me who the best player I played against was, it, it wouldn't be Skulls. It would be Henri. As a, as a footballer with multifaceted yeah. ability. What was, was Cantona like to be up against? Was it a lot of performance? He went on to be an actor. Was- Cantona was, was very good, but, but not a better footballer than Skulls. Who was the best United player you played against? Um... I mean, Ryan Giggs causes a lot of problems down the years. 
a lot of problems. But in terms of consistency, season in, season out, gigs, he's also cancelled. And by the way, one of the only deserved uh, to be cancelled. <laughs> I mean, come on. There has to be a rule here. Brothers' wives are not in the picture. But... Uh, no, Giggs, Giggs did. He was too inconsistent, really. If you look at numbers, if you look at figures, he was out, yeah, yeah, out of the team. I, the obviously, I, I only, I, what I'm going on is how they played against my team and how many times he destroyed my team. Yaya Torre <laughs> and, and has we, a massive argument. Yeah, Yaya Torre is an incredible footballer. Yeah, that's why, that's why this, I mean, given that it's now, what is it, nearly 30 years mm. since the Premier League started, um, you know, Kevin Kevin De Bruyne has to be in that conversation. I, I, I see. The problem is here. I can't leave skulls out. I, I, I can see that. I can't. I, I, I can't. <laughs> but I mean, there's probably there's probably names as well that you know. If we and really the, sat down and thought, we'd probably come up with another half a dozen. Aguero has a huge argument. Half a dozen names. Yeah, he would do. We've dissected and got to a point where we realised there is too many names. But I'll just give you my <laughs> four two. I'll listen to your four four two and tell you Van if I really. Sar, I'll only tell you if I vehemently disagree. Van der Sar, Cole, Terry. I, I get if Letitia is saying Van Dyke over Ferdinand they don't really have a leg to stand on Kyle Walker I go can't they due to his violent uh, versatility around the pitch beside Paul Scholes I'd go Ronaldo on the right Bale on the left with Rooney off on re. okay in a 4-4-2 yeah I mean I, I'd, I'd probably not put Kante in there and I'm surprised that you would put Kante in front of Roy Keane. The only reason you have to say Kante is because he won the league at Leicester. The next year he won the league at Chelsea in a manager's first season. And the next year he won the fucking World Cup. I mean, that's a pretty impressive three years <laughs> right not, there. It's not. <laughs> at the end of the day, you see leadership in the core and like that. It's the stupidest three years ever by a football player. He also won the FA Cup in that year. He won the World Cup too. Yeah, that's not. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not bad few years. I can. I mean, I can see why there's a there's a reason for it. Um, but again, you're citing team achievements to no. But he he was he, no, he was player. so important that each and but, every one of those teams. Oh, I mean, that season, he was Francis missing ingredient. Leicester, Leicester doesn't exist without him. Leicester was incredible. It doesn't exist without him. No. He 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 is that. That league. season, he was just phenomenal. In terms of uh, modern football. When you look at a player now, do you believe that us as fans are kind of pissing in the wind thinking that these guys consider or give a shit about what we want them to do? The lower leagues might be the answer. Mm. Do you know what? Uh, it's, it, it is interesting. I, I don't think the, the chasm between the fans and the players has ever been as big as it is now. Um, and I believe that that is due to the excessive amount of, of money that is being earned. Um, I believe that that volume of money gives the players uh, an overinflated sense of themselves. Um, you know, 25 years ago, I would play a game on a Saturday afternoon and whether we win or whether we lost, I would, I, if I had plans to go out for, with mates for that evening, I'd still go out. And I drink in bars in Southampton, um, and I would talk to people all night. They come and chat. They might want to talk about the game. Why were you crap today? <laughs> all that kind. Of, but I don't. I don't ever see that happening now. I don't ever speak to fans who go, "Oh, I saw such and such in the pub after the game. We had a chat about the game." Mm. It doesn't happen anymore. Uh, and I and I think that's one of the saddest things is that the the players have detached themselves from their communities um, and that was one of the big things that we had in our favour uh, in the 90s. Do, would you fear death and all? I mean, you are. I don't fear get... death. But you're, what, what, you're coming to the kind of age of I'll die before I have a natural boner again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I'd hope not. We're talking 30 years. 30 years is a short time and that's that's doing well. Does yeah. that scare you? No. Not not one bit. Not one bit. It's just part of the whole process. It's just part of the process. We're here and when it's your, I've always kind of believed when it's your time to go it's time to go so you just hold your hand up and go. And he should. It is, it is what it is. You don't remember any of this shit. And you don't remember being on the MA show or playing for Southampton. You just didn't Who exist. knows? Yeah. 
But if you could kind of... Who knows? If you could intellectualise it to the maximum, you do believe it was a chemical accident and you're gone. Um, I haven't really given it that much thought. I've never been um, a particularly religious person. I, I, mm. I'm not a churchgoer. Um, and I'm just thinking about it now. I'm I'm pretty open minded as to as to what happens afterwards, if I'm honest. Uh and if if that is if when your time's up I don't, and, what if, and you're gone. We, we use words like what happens. The, the argument is that happens as a result of existence, as a result of nothing happens. It's the first time in which nothing actually happens. <laughs> it's just eighteen eighty eight again. Yeah. And we never we never chipped goalkeepers. And we never spoke into microphones and we never got cancelled via fucking vultures on Twitter. <laughs> and the whole thing's pointless anyway, so stop giving a fuck. It is. That's that's a good attitude, really. I think that you're right. When you think about how big how big the world is and how small a part we play in it, yeah. we are completely fucking insignificant. Oh so my God. get over yourselves. It doesn't make stop any sense. thinking you're so important. And that's, that's and what's caused all this. And that's what's caused all this. And people going on about climate change because we can't really deal with the fact that humans were here way after Earth was and we've been so greedy. <laughs> the Earth is ours. The Earth is trying to tell us via fucking the melting of the ice caps. Your time is over. Fuck off. You won't survive in the new climate. We'll be fine. We'll be good, but you arrogant fuckers who develop Twitter and all this shit won't suit it. And maybe Branson and Musk get to Mars. But they're trying to tell us to fuck off, so we're cancelling people in response. There you go. Uh, Lagarde, Leticia, it's been a privilege to talk to you. Thank you um, as a football fan, and for many football fans listening, for the countless memories you gave us. And uh, thank you for coming on to the Michael Anthony Show. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure, mate. Good to talk to you. Cheers, mate. All the best. It's been how many years, my oh, boy. Not all the old milk started. Sure, you the still books. don't know my chairs of joy. No need to go, just take hey, it okay. slow. Podcast. And have you heard the Michael Anthony Show? Makes me see the light. What about those tears? Tears believe my eyes. How's it make a fair? Makes me feel alright.